Yeah, so now I'm doing a, a PhD thesis uh, in, um, in Pisay, uh, actually, in the University of the Père Blanc, from, like we have heard now uh, about it a bit. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll just begin to, so that I don't lose time. So unity of God and unity in God, a possible perspective and way of dialogue between the believers, a Shia perspective of dialogue between, uh, developed by Dr. Muhammad Ali Shomali. I have had the honor to participate in one of the meetings of Wings of Unity that have been held at Sofia University Institute in Italy. I have listened to the intervention of Dr. Muhammad Ali Shomali, and I was triggered by his out-of-the-box perspective of dialogue. In this paper, I would like to share with you what has triggered me in his perspective and discuss with you some challenges that might be arisen by many hearers of the argumentation of Shomali, since it is at the same time aligned in the Shia tradition, but also not so much known as a traditional Shia perspective in today's world. Unity of God is one of the major principles in Islam, highlights Shomali in his intervention which was transcribed in a book in 2017 entitled Unity of God and Unity in God. In fact, unity of God is a main principle in monotheism in general. Somali, Somali says that the principle of unity of God can be noticed in many resources in Islam. However, it was not always noticed as a principle for uniting people, but for many other purposes, mainly theology and theosophy. However, some have talked about this concept and anthropologically too. The unity of God is the main principle to follow. Shomali insists that there is nothing additional to Tawhid. Shomali explains how the principle of unity of God has a large influence on ethics. He bases his idea on what Al Alama Taba Taba'i wrote in Al Mizan fi Tafsir al Quran where he talks about an ethical system that he described as a system proper to the Quran. He said, the Quran has repeatedly said that the kingdom belongs to Allah, that the kingdom of the heavens and the earth is his, that to him belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth. Look at anything. You will see that Allah is the owner of its person and of all of its concomitants. When a man believes in that ownership and this belief becomes firmly rooted in his heart, he does not admit that anything has got any independence at all in its person, characteristics, or activities. Such a man cannot look except at the face of Allah, nor can he bow, nor can he bow down before, hope for, or have any fear of anything other than Allah. He will not enjoy or be pleased with any other thing, nor will he rely on surrender to anyone but Allah. In short, he will not desire or wish for anything except Allah, the eternal one who will remain when everything will perish. He will surely turn away from all the falsehood, that is, from everything other than Allah. He will not attach any importance to his own existence, nor will he care for himself in face of the absolute truth, that is, the eternal existence of his creator. Great is his glory. On the question where multiplicity comes from, in the question of Wahdat al-Wujud and unity of God and unity in God, one of the most relevant debates that have been arisen is how to explain diversity while affirming that all is one in God. Shomali refers to the ideas of Suhra Wardi and Mullah Sadra to explain his perception on the subject. He says, for some people, the idea was that the, cre the creatures, such as the birds, the angels, the non-living beings, the humans, have different realities. But Mullah Sadra, in Transcendent Philosophy, argued that when we only have one reality, and that is existence. That we only have one reality, and that is existence. And the differences stem from a difference in the intensity of existence. Therefore, the result is that what makes us different 
are our different degrees and intensity of existence. For Mullah Sadra, existence comes as a ladder, as a hierarchy. Each of us is a finite, limited being, but we have different degrees. So this perspective of the universe is a very important perspective because it puts you in a close and intimate relation with everything, and you do not differ in reality from each other. It is just a matter of degree. When it comes to human beings, their degree can vary depending on what they do, or more precisely, what they are. Mullah Sadra has the idea that human beings can actually be different in their species, and all birds are the same, are the same regardless of the type. But a human being can be totally different. This is a very important metaphysical approach to the issue of unity, says Shomal. Furthermore, Shomali, by referring to the philosophy of Sohrawardi, confirms that the pure darkness does not exist. He explains that darkness is not other than a lesser degree of light. He says, so we only have light, but a lesser light, a less intense compared to a higher light is darkness. So we do not have absolute darkness. Absolute darkness does not exist. Anything created by, by God has light, but we have different levels of light. Before continuing with the argumentation of Shomali concerning some verses in the Quran, let's pause and present the most obvious challenges that such a vision of reality might be confronted with. The long debate about the unity of God and unicity of God. Here Shomali might face all the questions about ishraq and tashbih. However, let's not forget that the idea of wahdatul wujud is a vision of the existence present in many Sufi and Shia traditions, and consequently, that Shomali is saying, that what Shomali is saying, although it might be challenged by some, but it would also be approved by many, since what he is saying is supported by a strong Islamic tradition, and not just an opinion of an out-of-the-box Muslim scholar, as I called him at the beginning of my intervention. From another side, the vision of the world that Shomali is presenting here is very respectful to diversity and gives a positive value to all the creation, since even darkness is a lesser degree of light, and pure dar darkness does not exist. However, the challenge here is the hierarchy that this vision constructs. I explain my concern. Perceiving the creation with hierarchy is a constant in most religions, if not in all. Same is in the Hellenic and Western schol uh, scholastic philosophy. However, when talking about different species in human beings and consequently arranging them in an ontological hierarchy, hierarchy that regards their nature, it is important to highlight that, that this differentiation concerns the prophets and the imams and that this does not con concern other people who are equal in their nature. In fact, if people are not equal in their species, there is no dialogue between equals, and the geniality of dialoguing under the umbrella of Wahdatul Wujud loses its vision of deep respect to the other in whom God is manifesting, and we lose the large, uh, the huge, excuse me, the urge of knowing the other who represents a way of God manifesting himself. Uh, Shumali says, we have a saying of Imam Ali, our first Imam, I have not seen anything without seeing God before him, after it, and with it. The Quran on unity. Shomali develops his idea of the unity of God, unity in God, by referring to some relevant verses in the Quran. He says, we can understand from the Quran that God's plan for humanity has been to unite around the truth, but voluntarily. He didn't want us to be forced to follow the truth and get united. He says, had God willed, he would have brought them together on guidance. But he didn't want to force us. Shomali highlights the distinction between two types of the will 
uh, of the will of God, the generative one and the legislative one. The first materializes uh, things and nothing exists without the will of God. As for the second, it is what God wants but does not force. And God wants the humanity to be united around the truth. He has invited us toward this. He has provided us with everything that we need for this, whether it, uh, whether, whether it be our moral conscience, our intellect, prophets, and revelation. Everything that we need, God has given us. Eventually, this is going to happen. Therefore, there is no way for this world to end without that plan of God materializing. But God does not force his plan. He's patient, he's patient says Somali. Another verse. A man, O mankind, indeed, we created you from a male and a female, and made you nations and tribes, that you may know each other. Indeed, the noblest of you in the sight of God is the most pious among you. Indeed, God, God is all-knowing, all aware. All Shomari comments this verse by saying that God in the Quran addresses sometimes the believers and sometimes the whole mankind. In the mentioned verse, God addresses mankind and tells them that he has created them all from Adam and Eve and has created them in different tribes and nations for the purpose of coming into mutual understanding and recognition and not to make someone superior to the other or to cause en enmity between them. Then God says that the most honorable between the people in the eyes of God are those who are more pious. In the whole Quran, there are only two things that I know, says Somali, that I know of which are mentioned as, as something that can raise someone's position. One is piety and the second is knowledge. These are very much connected. If you want to go higher, you have to be more, to be more pious and you have to be more knowledgeable. Furthermore, Shomali highlights the same book that the believers sh uh, share. He says, according to the Quran, the books given to Abraham, to Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Prophet Muhammad are not different books. Rather, these are different versions of the same book, different editions and representations of the same book. This is, very, is, it, this is a very important concept for unity, says Somali. However, he says, we see, we see how bad the response of humanity was. God saved them from one conflict and they start another conflict. They even start conflicting over what was supposed to give them unity, the book. And the only way to be saved from this conflict is to be really, truly faithful, committed to the truth. Here, I would like to highlight some challenges that might immediately come to our mind when we hear what we have heard. The problem in highlighting the commonalities in order to enhance unity is first of all to find commonalities approved to be as such by all parties. So I, I ask, is sharing the one same book in different versions is a common conviction? On the other hand, even if we agree that we have a lot in common, but is it useful to drop the fact that these commonalities have not been able through history to resolve the problems that our differences have created? Is the challenge to find commonalities or to manage the differences? Another challenge, thinking that being committed to the truth would save us from conflict. When truth is defined to a certain degree, and it is defined to a high degree in dogmatic religions in general, how much is being committed, committed to the dogmatic truth helpful to, the, to resolve conflicts and enhance dialogue? I think that truth, I think that through the vision of the world that Somali is suggesting, these challenges can be surpassed. To be clearer about what I am alluding to, let us go back in brief to the origins of the idea of Wahdat al-Wujud. After the translation movement of the Greek philosophy to the Arabic language in the first period of the Abbasid Caliphate, Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, 
and other oriental religious tendencies, such as per Persian ones, were spread in the Islamic world. This movement has produced many prestigious philosophers, such as Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, and has had an important influence on many Islamic currents, such as Sufism, and has led to the development of what is called philosophical Sufism. In this movement, the idea of Wahdatul Wujud has been developed. This idea has been developed in many ways, but in general, the vision of Wahdatul Wujud considers that all is one, only God is the truthful reality, Al Haq. As for the world or the created universe, it is a simple manifestation of what is real. The essence of God, although remains totally unknown and unattainable, it manifests in an infinite number of various forms that are seen in the different levels of the being. Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi, who is one of the most notable Sufi philosophers, considered that the creator, al-Haq, and the creature, al-Khalq, are, are not to be considered as different beings or different degrees of being as considered by many Neoplatonists. According to Ibn al-Arabi, the creator, al-Haq, and the uh, creature, al-Khalq, are to be considered aspects, wujuh, of the same reality, which is one and multiple at the same time. According to the Hadith Kuntu, the divine essence is a hidden divine treasure, kuntu kanzan makhfiyan, unknown in its transcendence, but wanted, habba, to be known, wanted to be known. And for this reason, uh, it created the universe and manifested through it. In this vision, love acquired different ontological dimensions and is perceived as the internal movement of the real, al-haq, towards its own manifestations that constitute the created universe. Love is the first and ultimate cause of the existence of the universe, as proclaimed by Ibn al-Arabi. The movement from nothingness, al-adam, to existence, al-wujud, has been a movement of love of the creator, al-mujid, toward the world. There is no movement in the universe that is not in relation with love. Love is the principle, al-asl, of all existent beings. Always from the Arabic, definitely. Such love is definitely universal and cosmic. And in this context, it becomes more understandable when Ibn al-Arabi and other Sufis and Muslims in general talk about the unity of religions, Wahdat al adyam Wonderful verse of Ibn al-Arabi about the subject. We heard it also this morning. Um, it says, لَقَدْ سَارَ قَلْبِي قَابِلًا كُلَّ سُورَةً فَمَرْعًا لِغِزْلَانٍ وَدَيْرٍ لِرُهْبَانِ وَبَيْتٌ لِأَوْثَانٍ وَكَعْبَةُ طَائِفٍ وَأَلْوَاحُ تَوْرَاتٍ وَمِصْحَفُ قُرْآنِ أَدِينُ بِدِينِ الْحُبِّ أَنَّا تَوَجَّهَتْ رَكَائِبُهُ فَالْحُبُّ دِينِي وَإِيمَانِي My heart has come to accept every image and every form, the gazelle's pasture and the monk's cloister, cloister a house of idols and a house for a pilgrim, the tablets of the Torah the to and book of the Quran. My religion is that of love. Wherever it, it mounts may take me. Love is my religion and my faith. With this, I would conclude by saying that the challenges mentioned before might become obstacles if we understand unity as unicity, if we understand dialogue as a way to transform the diversity into one thing, if we think that the diversity is a problem to be resolved in unicity and not a positive state that is linked together in love. Talking about love in religious dialogue has not been taken seriously usually. In fact, most of the times, the defensiveness and the dogmatic truth, the defensive and the dogmatic truth of each party has gotten in the way. But if the truth is not other than love, and this is what proclaim many religions and faith, if the love is the link that brings the, the diversity into unity, and um, into unity as seen before, doesn't it worth a shot to live the interreligious dialogue on the basis of love? Love is action 
uh, yes, th love is action towards the loved, but mostly it is a state. So the work is on the relationship between the parties of the dialogue, but also it is an inner work of purification and transformation that each party would be invi invited to do internally. Thank you. Mm -hmm.